do expect others uh, during the course of the, of the afternoon. Uh, members with no objection, we're going to move items four, six, seven, and eight on consent. Four, six, seven, and eight. But no objection. Uh, Mr. Price, there's a card on number six. Okay. All right, we're going to see if we can get a quorum. All right, in the interim, why don't we, uh, we've got two prospective commissioners. Um, Mr. Ray Bishop for the Los Angeles Convention Center and Exhibition Authority Commission. Why don't you come on up? And Mr. Keith Martin. Both of you gentlemen would not mind joining us. Good morning. Good morning. I think we can even provide you with a chair <laughs> somewhere. Ah, there it is. <clears throat> well, gentlemen, this is a, certainly one of the longer titled commissions. And uh, giving the news of the day, past several days, one of a uh, great deal of interest. Uh, why don't you give the uh, council and those in attendance a chance to just learn a little bit more of you and your interest and your commitment to serving in this important capacity. Let's start with you, Mr. Bishop. Uh, well, th first of all, thank you for the honor. I uh, have served uh, under Mayor Bradley on the uh, Council on Aging, and previously I served on the Harbor Commission, uh, the Export Terminal, under uh, Mayor Reardon and then uh, uh, Mayor Hahn. I'm a uh, Vietnam veteran, a founding member of Teleco, a former uh, hospital chairman, and uh, member of the Producers Guild and owner of a comedy club, so I know uh, the entertainment business convention, and more importantly, I, uh, I uh, work uh, as an activist in, in support of the community, been on the neighborhood council, and uh, work for small business, and I'm uh, honored to uh, be before you today. Thank you. Okay. And uh, so what do you... What kinds of skills, experiences do you bring to this uh, commission that uh, will benefit the commission and citizens of Los Angeles? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member. No, I was saying what kind of skills and abilities do you bring to this particular commission responsibility? Well, I think uh, primarily I have an interest in uh, seeing the uh, community Los Angeles grow uh, and uh, to have a good image for the world to uh, see that there are good events. My own personal skills, I've been uh, a member of the Producers Guild. I've worked to create motion pictures and I've worked in television. I own the LA Cabaret Comedy Club for 15 years in Encino and uh, produced shows there. I, I was uh, responsible for creating the entertainment and uh, the taste of Encino was something that when I served on the board of the Chamber of Commerce in Encino, uh, uh, was one of the ideas that we developed and I provided entertainment for that one for the Brentwood Street Fair, for the Sherman Oaks uh, 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 Street Fair, the Taste of Tarzana. So I've had a lot of experience dealing with entertainment and I've served in uh, many um, uh, public uh, areas where uh, I understand the importance of working with people and to provide uh, good entertainment. I understand the value of that. And uh, I think that that's one of the things that I can bring to it. I'm also uh, dedicated, and if there's a, uh, there's a certain uh, objective that is defined, that I uh, will help to see that it's, uh, it comes about. And, uh, and the vision that the city has is something that I hope that we can work together to move forward with. Okay, thank you. Mr. Martin, Keith Martin. Hi. Hi. I'm honored to be here as well. Um, I currently work at Veteran Affairs. I work as a social worker at the outpatient drug treatment program, which is specifically with schizophrenics and psychotic patients. Uh, that's my full-time job. While working there, I also am a board member at Clinical Romero in the Westlake area, uh, which serves also in Boyle Heights. Um, 
I'm a former West LA uh, neighborhood council member. Uh, I also uh, am a member of Eastside Riders, so I, I volunteer with them as well. Um, so, I, you know, to answer your question, you're asking, Mr. Bishop. You know, my experience is primarily uh, doing a lot of social work in these different kind of programs. I, I advocate for the homeless. I advocate for the youth. Uh, specifically, I also do fundraising for these organizations as well. Okay. Members, any questions for our prospective members, commissioners? Well, certainly, um, uh, in the news recently has been the extension, proposed extension for the football team, uh, for AEG to see if we can get a team, uh, and uh, uh, an opportunity to um, create some designs for a new convention center, which we're going to need, whether or not we get a team. Any, any thoughts about that, that process or the significance of it for us? Either of you? Well, this is, uh, this is exciting. I think Los Angeles needs a football team. My, my son Chris is here. His cousin is Justin Forsett, who plays for Baltimore. He's been a leading rusher with California, and uh, he's uh, very popular with the uh, members of the league. Uh, they all uh, respect and look up to him. He's one of the leading uh, rushers per carry. Uh, and uh, uh, we all love sports, football. We've had some great teams in Los Angeles. I'm a, a, a Laker fan, a Clipper fan, a Dodger fan, and uh, you know, I, uh, I love UCLA and USC football, and I'm mm -hmm. sure that if we can bring a, uh, a major football team here to LA, it's going to be great for our community. There's so many people that uh, miss what we've had in the past, and if uh, we can work together to bring that about, I think it's a great thing. Okay. What I'm getting is that this commission is about to get a lot of attention, I have a feeling. Uh, Saturday night I was out uh, and saw ESPN and saw the mayor's statement about uh, the football team on ESPN, which I've never seen our, our, any mayor uh, on ESPN mention before. So I'm gathering that this commission is going to spend a lot of time looking not only at the convention center plans, but also at the football plans and AG's plans uh, for the city and primarily about revenue uh, for the city. Mm -hmm. So commissioners uh, from the city and the, and the, the county are going to need to be able to work together well. And I'm, my experience is, is building consensus on any you know, board that I'm on. So that's what I'm intending to do, uh, is try and very hard to give the city council uh, a, a good idea about what the, the commission thinks, at least from you know, working together with all the other commissioners. Mm -hmm. Well, I think certainly based on your, your past experiences and, and skills that uh, the commission and the city will benefit from uh, your, your knowledge and your, uh, your new eyes on this uh, topic, uh, so to speak. Um, and uh, I'm confident that uh, when we get a majority that we will be able to pass you out uh, with uh, full concurrence and, and, and recommend your approval to the city council uh, at some date soon to be set. Uh, members, any other comments? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for Great your willingness to serve. Thank you. Thank you so much. As soon as we get a quorum, we'll be taking a vote on that matter. We do have one card on this uh, on this item, uh, Mr. Herman. On item two. Item two is a very sensitive issue because the requirements extend to the city of Los Angeles, but we all have seen that many social workers today do not do an adequate job in providing uh, housing for VA veterans and the disabled population in our streets today. And again, this replacement, based on the August 4th, 2014 recommendation by Mayor Garcetti, I find it um, faultful because again, it should always have the importance of public interest when making decisions on the welfare and the benefits for those of the public. 
When it comes to selecting excuse individuals, me, excuse me, sir, under the authority, I don't, I don't, I don't believe you're on, uh, and commissioned for the. Agenda, Mr. Herman, we just want to. Can you hold my please. time, please? I, I don't believe you're on the agenda item right now. We're on number two, convention center. I am speaking on this item here relative to the appointment of Mr. Keith Martin, sir. So you're probably off topic, irrelevantly interrupting me. So, so how can I go back to Mr. Mr. Herman, just c c continue, I please. Mr. Attorney? Yes. Do you have an instruction? Um, I would ask him to stay on the appointment. Right, stay on the appointment, sir. On item number two. So while well, the gentleman sitting here at the right, Mr. Keith Martin, pointed out that he had his experience and the ability to perform these duties, not once did I hear of his support for social workers, for housing, for the VAs, and the disabled population throughout the city of Los Angeles. So again, again my recommendation. Again, I believe he's getting off topic. As a citizen. I would ask Mr. Herman, please uh, stay on this may topic. May otherwise, your time will conclusion, be sir? You may. Thank you. So communication by the mayor relative to the convention center for this Authority Commission for the term lasting from 2015 as of today, I find it um, unrecommended, but as we all know, it's a yay, yay, yay demonstration of your approval anyways. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I believe we... Uh I believe we we we've, we've acquired a quorum. <laughs> uh, we're going to continue item five. Uh, we'll continue that for thirty days. How long are you continuing it for? Pardon. Thirty days. Thirty. Okay. Thirty days. Uh, continue till when, sir? Pardon? Is it 30 days? 30 days. 30? Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, no, we're going to do it right now. We will, uh, if there's no objection with the quorum, we will, consume, uh, we will approve the consent calendar. Uh, items 4, 6, 7, and 8. If there's an objection, that will be the order. Um, We've heard um, Mr. Bishop, Mr. Martin, um, prospective appointees to the Los Angeles Convention Center and Exhibition Authority Commission um, for um, terms ending in 2017 for Mr. Bishop and 2015 for uh, Mr. Martin without objection. I'll be happy to move both appointments. Okay, those, uh, those two appointments uh, are, are moved and approved. Approved and moved. Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on to item uh, item number item three. three. Item three. Item number three is a motion prize Corrette's Wesson relative to the feasibility of establishing a city of Los Angeles fair <coughs> chance initiative also known as ban the box policy to remove barriers for individuals with a criminal record and an examination of ban the box policies in other cities. Uh, members with, uh, with your support, uh, I introduced the Fair Chance Initiative, also known as the ban the box in June of this year. And I'm excited that it's the topic of our discussion at uh, our committee meeting today. The movement to ban the box is growing strong with several other municipalities and states adopting policies to remove the box from job applications. Even states like New Jersey, with the conservative leader, uh, Chris Christie, signed the ban the box policy. So if New Jersey can do it, so can the city of Los Angeles. Yeah. Please, please hold your applause. Please, please hold your applause. We all know someone who has struggled to find employment, especially during the last few years of this economic recession. It's even harder for those who, who have prior convictions making their entry back into society uh, is very difficult. According to the National Institute of Justice, a criminal record reduces the likelihood of a job offer by 50%. The 
The impact is even stronger, even greater amongst African Americans and Latinos who already experience racial discrimination in the labor market. It's no wonder that we have such a high recidivism rate. And with realignment, even more offenders are going to be released. According to uh, figures we've received, approximately 9,000 um, offenders are going to be released, uh, released into LA County alone during this next year. Without a policy in place, many of these people will have trouble reintegrating into society. And it's not just the individuals that suffer, but their families as well uh, and the community at large. I've heard countless stories about how this is issue has negatively impacts children, spouses, and parents of those uh, who are formally uh, convicted. Stories that are extremely powerful, and I know we're going to hear from some of those folks today. But before we take the public comment, I'd like to call to call up to, uh, to the panel uh, a uh, number of experts on this topic. We have with us today Maurice Emels mm, Emelsom, <coughs> Project Director for the National Employment Law Project, Jenny Chang from the California Endowment, and Zach Hoover, Executive Director of LA Voice. Can you please come forward? After their presentations, we will uh, have some public comment. We also have a, a representative from the mayor's office um, and uh, the Californians for Safety and Justice. Let me ask you both to come forward as well. Who's here from the mayor's office? Come on down. And Californians for Safety and Justice? Yeah, please feel free to join us. Okay, let's... Uh, Let's, present, let's begin our conversation. Um, Maurice? M. Sels. M. Salem. M. Salem. I'm going to defer to my colleague over here. I think she was. Okay. I'm gonna go. All right. We'll go with, with Jenny. Yes, Jennifer. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Cheung, and I'm a program manager at the California Endowment. I want to thank Chairman Price and the other members of the committee for the opportunity to address you this afternoon on the Fair Chance Hiring Initiative. For those of you familiar with the endowment, you know that we are a health foundation, and you may wonder why we're interested in an issue like Ban the Box. It's because we believe that good health is determined by much more than just having health insurance or going to the doctor. It's determined by the places where we live, work, and play, in short, by our communities. In particular, healthy communities are those where all people can take a healthy and active role, and this includes youth and people coming out of prisons and jails. In addition, we recognize that good health is not evenly distributed in our society. In particular, boys and men of color have the shortest life expectancies and fall short on many indicators of good health and well-being. Creating healthy communities cannot be achieved in any meaningful way unless the negative health trends experienced by boys and men of color can be reversed. It is for this reason that we have developed a specific boy focus on boys and men of color through our Sons and Brothers Initiative. Through Sons and Brothers, we are working to keep young men on track in school and to help them to get back on track when needed. And this includes reducing barriers to reintegrating into the community for those returning from incarceration. We are at a moment in time where we have been forced to recognize that how we've been working to keep our communities safe and healthy isn't sustainable and isn't working for many in the population. The over-reliance on incarceration as a tool for community safety hasn't just resulted in over-policing and skyrocketing budgets for prisons and jails, but also means that an increasingly large percentage of our population is shackled with a criminal record. This fa fact was recently recognized by the President's Task Force for My Brother's Keeper, which recommends, quote, implementing reforms to promote successful re-entry, including hiring practices such as ban the box, which is, gives applicants a fair chance and allows employers the opportunity to judge individual job candidates on their merits as they re-enter the workforce, unquote. We know that people coming out of prison and jails have many and complex needs, including significant physical and mental health problems, which is something we all need to work together to address. However, the most commonly stated re-entry need is employment. In a recent Vera Institute study commissioned by the endowment, of people returning to Boyle Heights in South LA from LA County Jail, 73% identified employment as their greatest need, followed by housing and substance abuse treatment. When we talk about successful reentry, we often measure it in terms of rates of recidivism, which is the likelihood that someone will commit another crime and have to go back to jail, but we think this is a very low bar to set for ourselves. 
We don't just want people who have spent time in jail or prison to stay out of trouble, but we want them to become productive, contributing members of our society. And employment is a big part of accomplishing both those goals. So we should be doing whatever we can to reduce barriers to jobs, especially those barriers that come into place before the hiring process even begins. Ultimately, we know that having a job will reduce recidivism, contribute to family reunification and stability, and help people to live healthier lives. We all, all of us, desire to be given a fair chance and be judged by our merit, not just by our greatest mistakes. Ban the Box helps to reduce barriers for those re-entering our community and gives them a chance at meaningful employment, self-efficacy, and contributing to the betterment of society, which is something that we all desire. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Zach? Oh, no, now you want My to go. My turn now. Okay, now you want to go. Okay, Maurice. Nope, that's okay. Uh, Chairman Price, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of the City Council's motion to establish a fair chance hiring initiative. My name is Maurice Semsalem. I'm director of the National Employment Law Project's Access and Opportunity Program. We've had the privilege of working here in California and across the country on dozens of fair chance hiring initiatives, partnering with local organizations like LA Voice, Homeboy Industries, New Way of Life, and government officials. Today I'd like to offer a bit of a national perspective on the fair chance hiring movement that has spread across the nation and highlight some of the best practices that can help shape a strong and fair policy tailored to the needs of Los Angeles workers and employers. With the exceptional leadership provided by you, um, Chairman Price and Mayor Garcetti, we believe that a genuine opportunity exists to forge an LA policy that can be held up as a model for the rest of the nation to follow. First, it's important to emphasize the breadth and depth of the employment challenges facing people with criminal records. There are an estimated 70 million U.S. adults with an arrest or conviction record, and over one in 10 of them reside in California. That's an average of about one in four adults who have a criminal record that will show up on a routine criminal background check. And the situation is dramatically more severe, of course, in communities of color, urban areas, in and around Los Angeles that have been hardest hit by overcriminalization and mass incarceration. Given the vast proliferation of background checks for employment, nine out of ten employers now conduct background checks for employment, it's nearly impossible for people with records to compete for jobs, even in a growing economy. Without minimizing the challenge, clearing the path to employment can make all the difference in the lives of people with criminal records, their families, and communities. One study that helps drive this point home followed a cohort of about 2,000 people who were released from Illinois prisons. The three-year recidivism study found that formerly incarcerated people with one year of employment were three times less likely to end up back in prison than everyone else. Given the devastating numbers of people with a criminal record in major urban areas like Los Angeles, it's not surprising that the local economy suffers as well when they are routinely and unfairly shut out of the labor market. For example, a Philadelphia study found that securing employment for just 100 formerly incarcerated people would increase their combined lifetime earnings by $55 million and increase their tax contributions by $2 million. At the same time, the study documented another two million in criminal justice savings annually. And although there's a long way to go, there's clearly momentum building here in California and across the country to turn the situation around. That's the good news. There's probably no better example of the vibrancy, the vibrancy and power of the criminal justice reform movement than the fair chance hiring initiatives that have rapidly taken hold around the country. Fair chance hiring refers to a set of hiring policies designed to ensure that applicants with criminal records are evaluated on the merits of their qualifications, not just their criminal records. Fair chance hiring incorporates ban the box policies, which remove the criminal history question till the end of the hiring process, but they also encompass broader, a broader set of criminal background check protections modeled on the best practices um, promoted by the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. It's been a remarkable couple years of fair chance hiring activity, which provides an indication of the special opportunity presented here in Los Angeles to forge broad consensus around a robust fair chance hiring ordinance. Already a couple examples of all that activity has been mentioned. 
Jennifer mentioned the endorsement from the President's My Brother's Keeper Task Force. That provided a big boost to the Fair Chance movement. Chairman Price, you mentioned that New Jersey just became the 13th state to, to enact Fair Chance hiring legislation, but it's also the sixth state that covers not just public employers, but all private employers as well. Uh, and there's a beautiful quote from Governor Christie uh, uh, endorsing it, not just signing the legislation, but strongly endorsing the legislation. Uh, in July, California's ban the box law took effect as applied to all public employers in the state. We surveyed the state's largest cities and counties and found universal compliance with the new state mandate. And nationally, there are now over 70 cities and counties that adopted fair, hand, fair chance hiring, including a growing number that apply fair chance hiring to the private sector. In addition to San Francisco, which implemented its private sector law in August, the new list of cities that have expanded fair chance hiring to private employers include Seattle, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Buffalo, Newark, and the District of Columbia. And there's also a bill supported by Mayor de Blasio that is poised to pass the city council, also covering private sector employers. And finally, we're seeing here many more employers embracing fair chance hiring in the employer community. For example, Kais, we, we recently completed a study of healthcare background checks. Kaiser Permanente sat down with us and pledged to remove the criminal history question from its job applications by the end of the year. So they'll be joining Target, Walmart, and several other major retailers that already do so. Several chambers of commerce have also supported fair chance hiring, including the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, which endorsed AB 218, the new California state law. Given all this activity, Los Angeles has the benefit of significant experience from cities and states across the nation to shape a fair chance hiring ordinance that is both robust, robust in its coverage, but also in its implementation and enforcement. We wanted to highlight, uh, just wrap up by highlighting some of the, the special provisions of the San Francisco ordinance, which we think are helpful for Los Angeles to consider. Like a growing number of states and cities, San Francisco applies its fair chance hiring policy to private employers and city contractors. And of course, that's the critical first, net, first step to a model policy. Second, it prohibits employers from asking about the criminal history question until the end of the hiring process. And then in addition to these core provisions, the San Francisco Fair Chance Ordinance guarantees a full and fair process that requires people with a criminal record to be judged based on their life experiences since their conviction. For example, it prevents employers from considering convictions older than seven years, along with expunged records, arrests, and juvenile records. It includes important consumer rights that the worker has to receive a copy of the record to verify its accuracy, and a statement explaining the reasons why the employer is considering denying the individual the job based on his or her criminal, criminal record. There's way more to the San Francisco ordinance. I won't get into all the details, but I hopefully this quick summary provides a flavor of what a model policy could and should look like. Finally, I just have a couple words about enforcement, which uh, is another critical feature of a model policy. I know it comes up as well for this committee uh, uh, in relation to its motions to raise the minimum wage and enact uh, uh, a wage theft provision to get it uh, rampant wage theft. San Francisco's Office of Labor Standards Enforcement is charged with implementing and enforcing the fair chance hiring law, along with several other laws adopted by the city. Seattle also has a dedicated agency that enforces its private sector employment laws. So we urge the committee to give serious consideration to a similar approach toward enforcement, especially now that it's taking up several other progressive employment provisions covering the private sector workforce. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Zach? Thank you, Chairman Price. Thank you, honorable members of the committee. I'm Minister Zachary Hoover, a minister in the American Baptist Church, and also have the honor of uh, being the executive director of LA Voice. For those of you who may not know, LA Voice is a congregation-based community organization where we work with faith communities in 10 city council districts across the city, as well in other parts of Los Angeles County. We're also members of Pico, California, which is uh, one of the largest uh, the largest faith-based grassroots organization in the, in the uh, state and one of the largest uh, grassroots organizations in the state. So I would just like to highlight a, a little bit for you of the report that I shared with you and I've seen that some of you have in front of you and have had a chance to peruse already. We've just finished this report. I think it builds on what uh, Maurice just shared with us and what this could mean for Los Angeles. Um, 
the first thing is just to share some LA numbers, which are on the first page there, uh, there at the, the bottom, where we talk about what, what's the impact of this in Los Angeles. So we know that each year, tens of thousands of men and women are returning to Los Angeles after serving time in county jail or in state or federal prison. And roughly one third of all state parolees call Los Angeles home. So we're set to have the highest per capita uh, parolee rate in the entire United States. So there's ample reason for us here in Los Angeles to pass a significant policy. It's going to benefit so many members of our community. I'm not going to turn around and look, but I bet if people in this room raise their hands, if they themselves or they know someone who has been incarcerated, a lot of hands would be in the air right now. Are they doing it? Yep, <laughs> they're doing it. Um, there are also two local examples, and there are other examples in this room that you can find in the report. We're going to hear a little bit more from Jose Osuna from Homeboy Industries and the work he does around job placement. We also highlight in the report some of the work of Shields for Families and Joe Paul, who runs the Jericho Training Center and Placement Center in Watts and South Los Angeles, talks about not just the economic benefit that this has for folks, but also the self-esteem benefit the, as people are seeking to see themselves and be seen in a different way. Um, I'd like to highlight also just the racial impact of this uh, through sharing a, a quote from our report on the third page. Just like the rest of the criminal justice system, the outcomes are racialized and the inputs are racialized in many ways. So research shows that having a felony conviction and being an African American has a significant compounding negative effect on the ability to find employment. For example, in a 2003 article in the American Journal of Sociology, Devot Pager reports that 17% of white job applicants with a criminal record received a callback, while only 5% of African Americans with a criminal history heard back from a potential employer. So we can see that in, a, in addition to the, already the challenges that communities of color face around employment, when we add the criminal conviction history to it, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, what's the word? It's, uh, it's like a parable, uh, uh, parabola, parabola, what's that thing called? Um, Anyway, Matt. Yeah, that's a problem. So, um, and then just lastly, I want to draw your attention to one, one final piece here. We interviewed Assistant Chief of LAPD, Michael Moore, for this report. And uh, he himself identified four areas that, when addressed, increased the opportunity for full integration. Mental health services, substance abuse counseling, housing, and a job. And I just want to quote here from the report and from Chief Moore. Our state's criminal justice system has failed woefully at addressing these needs while someone is incarcerated, says Moore, making it even more critical that barriers are removed and support is provided when men and women return home to their communities. In a, community, in a county that receives roughly one quarter of all state parolees, successful reentry has far-reaching implications. It contributes to stronger, safer neighborhoods and communities and begins to shift the spending from law enforcement and incarceration to schools, programs that create opportunity and infrastructure needs. Just as a final comment, uh, you know, I just want to add that there are so many people that I personally love who are hurting from this policy. They suffer from it every time they go out for a, for a job interview. Some of them are in this room today. And I see the impact that that struggle has on uh, the other struggles that they're facing in their lives. And I'm just very excited to, uh, to be here and have the opportunity for us to look at this in a serious way, what we can do for formerly incarcerated Angelinos, our brothers and sisters in this city. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good afternoon. Abigail Marquez, a Workforce Development Director in the Office of Mayor Eric Garcetti. Thank you to the council members of this committee for your leadership um, and to especially to Council Member Curran Price for bringing this very important issue to light. Since Mayor Garcetti took office last year in July, he has been focused on his commitment to turn the city around, to rebuild our economy, to help lift families out of poverty, and engage all Angelinos, especially the most vulnerable, in accessing higher wage jobs and creating a robust workforce. Our role as public servants is to ensure that we don't leave anyone behind. So when we talk about expanding training and employment opportunities for Angelinos, particularly hard to serve populations, then we must also look at policies that we need to implement or revise or expand to remove barriers to employment. You just heard the staggering re-entry statistics from our state and especially here in our region. One in every four adults in California has an arrest or a conviction record, and one out of every three returns to Los Angeles. This issue impacts individuals from across multiple demographics. It impacts veterans, homeless individuals, people with disabilities, youth, women, 
people with mental health challenges, former gang members, families, and especially children. So on behalf of Mayor Garcetti, we are supporting legislation to extend a fair chance to all Angelinos and to ban the box here in LA, not just from our employment application process, but to take this even further and look at ordinances that have been implemented in similar cities, such as San Francisco. Nothing is more effective at breaking the cycle of recidivism than a good job, and that's what this is all about. We look forward to working with members of the City Council and the business community here in Los Angeles to identify strategies and implement policies that will create fair employment opportunities and give individuals with prior convictions a second chance. Thank you. Thank you. Californians for Safety and Justice. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Mike Delarocha. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Californians for Safety and Justice. Uh, before I go on, I just want to say thank you for your leadership to put this forward, um, both you as the electives and your staff. As a former staffer here, I know how much work it takes, so thank you so much for bringing this forward. Um, California's of Safety and Justice, we are a statewide organization, um, headquartered in Oakland, but we have staff throughout the state. We help provide technical assistance and support to legislators and elected officials. And we currently run Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, which is the largest network of crime victims in California right now. Uh, we come here to um, stand in support of this, this motion in the efforts to move a fair chance hiring ordinance. Um, this would provide an opportunity for LA to join San Francisco, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and other cities that were mentioned in terms of implementing policies that impact multiple communities. It's not just formerly incarcerated, but it's veterans and youth, the homeless population, the disabled, and others. So this is a broad-reaching effort that would impact numerous communities. Our studies, a work across the state, as well as the testimony, as you'll hear, prove that these kind of policies do a number of things, but three things I really want to highlight is, one, is they reduce recidivism, two, they increase public safety, and three, they remove unnecessary barriers to employment. This opportunity that we have would complement not only your councils, but also the mayor's efforts to remove unnecessary barriers and provide people an opportunity to get a job. So it's not only a practical thing to do, but it's the right thing to do and in alignment with what's going on, not only here, but across the country. So I thank you for your leadership and look forward to working with you as we move this forward. Thank you. For, for the audience, let me just uh, clarify. This is still a work in progress. There is nothing before us to vote on today. Uh, we're told that we should have a report back from the CLA in, in, six, in 45 to 60 days. And so we'll be taking a, a specific proposal at that time. But I think uh, the input, the discussion today is, uh, is important uh, as this um, works its way through the process and certainly uh, providing uh, elected officials and other a better understanding of, of the impact, the scope, uh, what the obstacles and what the opportunities are for uh, a fair chance hiring kind of initiative. Uh, I think there are some questions, but let, let me ask uh, kind of an overriding one. Uh, in, in those communities where um, the private sector has been involved, uh, when, when the private sector is included, um, initially there was some resistance, no resistance, uh, widely accepted. Uh, what, what was the experience? I mean, I, I know San Francisco is probably the best example of that, where they, they were involved uh, and, and Target was involved because they... Uh, they the Target, out. UPS, and... Walmart. Walmart? Well, Target was actually involved, though, in helping to uh, work on the San Francisco ordinance, per se. Um, and then, and again, the, the San Francisco chamber. And, and I think it had to do with the quality and support of the ultimate product as well. And, and, and I can just tell you, it's one of the best ordinances there is in the country. And, and it was backed by the chamber. It's not, you know, everybody comes to the table with their issues. And it's very hard sometimes to predict what issues the employer community have, other communities will have, but it's important to have that discussion to come up with the best policy. Thank you. Mrs. Martinez? Uh, I have just maybe you can help me clarify this. So the way I understand AB 218 to work, it only applies, and it went into effect July 1st of this year, right? So it only applies to state and local governments in California. Mm -hmm. So what the study would be doing, the report would be asking is how we would implement it in Los Angeles to apply it to the private sector? And are you supporting any, is there an effort statewide to, to do that, which you're asking the city to, do, to look into, whether it, whether how, how it can be applied to the private sector? Are we looking at that uh, statewide as well? Because AB 218 didn't 
right. uh, the public uh, sector did not was not included in that, correct? Right, right. So is there a movement to do that statewide? Because it's almost feel like this also needs to be something that the state, should be a state fix to this issue. Right. I mean, we just got the law, it was just passed a year ago, just implemented to st and starting with the public sector, which is, which is also very consistent with the way this issue has played out in other states. Minnesota, for example, started with the public sector and eventually uh, some of the cities did private sector and eventually the state went ahead and did private sector too. But it's, you know, it, these, these policies start from the ground up and, and, and the stronger policies often start in local communities where there's a lot of need, like Los Angeles. So I would say that's kind of how those the, the state policies where they exist, that's often how they've evolved. Did AB 218 include the private sector at the beginning? No, never. It was only never. public sector. I, I will say that um, our own chamber, LA Chamber of Commerce, is um, hugely in support of this effort here. And as the largest chamber in the state, they want to play a more active role in trying to help move this forward. So this is one of the few opportunities where you have a good broad-based coalition of not just labor, but business and private and public sector coming together. Is anyone introducing in the state legislature that you know in introducing a statewide legislation to ban the box? You don't not, know yeah. uh, not at this point. I mean, it's hard to say what's going to happen next session. But who carried AB? <laughs> sorry, who carried AB 18? Uh, Assemblyman Dickinson. Dickinson. I worked with him on the will for defiance. Yeah, he's he's been. And now he's running for the state senate. senate. Isn't he? Yeah, he is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have to say, one of the things that frustrated me a lot in Sacramento uh, was some years ago, the Department of Corrections decided to change its name hmm. to the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And that was about the last thing that they ever did relating to rehabilitation. Uh, because in the years since then, there's been a persistent dismantling of any effort whatever to try to rehabilitate people who find, found their way into the, uh, into the system. Um, when we were, three of us were, were there at the time, and we were having to endure these budget cuts at the state level, things like literacy programs, and job training programs, and uh, you know, violence counseling, and things, the, the, the most cost effective, substance most common substance abuse uh, prevention, the most common sense steps that you could possibly take, uh, not only to improve the lives of the, those who are incarcerated, but everybody in the state and reducing the risks to public safety. That, that, and, and all of those things were being swept away one after the other. So uh, a step like this that allows people to move forward in getting their life together, getting a good job, any job, um, is uh, just such an important step forward. And Mr. Chairman, I want to applaud you on, on bringing this forward because I, I, I can't stress enough how important this is, not just to the people who are currently being shut out from the employment market, but to our economy, to public safety, um, to our city's, city and county budget. Um, in, in almost every way, this is a, a big step forward, I think, uh, for us as a city. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, I, I didn't, if we're moving forward uh, with a motion to request the report back today, I, I think, um, do no, we have to do that? No, or? I think the, no, the, the, okay. the, the motion's been made. This is just an informational hearing today. Well, I think it's a, a terrific step forward. Just to dovetail a little bit on Ms. Martinez's question about the statewide impact on the private sector, the one question I had about the local ordinances that are already in place, um, If, if you are applying this broadly to the private sector, is there precedent for uh, local government to uh, have an ordinance dealing with the hiring process outside of contracting and so forth um, that would not be preempted by state fair employment and housing? And has that ever been so that would be preempted unless there's a contract? No, 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 nothing's been printed. No, no, has it's, it been, it's been legislated in, in uh, you're asking about California or elsewhere around the country? In, in California, yeah, just in because California, of the there are a few localities, Richmond, a couple others, San Francisco, and there's been no discussion of preemption. I mean, this is all, these are all, uh, in terms of the human, say, human rights law, these are all. Um, the law is pretty clear that you can add to the protections, just not interfere with current law and, and this these
expand the box policies, just add to the current okay. protections. So, I mean, for sure, I think wherever there's city contracting involved or any city benefits involved or anything like that, I, it seems to me it would be unquestionably fair game for us to yeah. uh, have such a, a mandate. No, it's never out. come up. I mean, we've okay. been pretty tuned just in to all of it. I can just tell you that much, yeah. When we're looking at best practices, I want to make sure we insulate this ordinance from a potential okay. challenge. So that would be something that I would want to be looking at. But um, I think it's I don't want to interrupt really important that type of advice should probably come from the city attorney also. If, Sorry? We, if we want to have a preemption, that, that advice should probably come from the city attorney. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if, okay. if we were to get legal advice on it, yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking about what the best practices have been elsewhere and whether there have been challenges of those words. You're thinking outside well, the box. You have the San Francisco ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you have the San Francisco ordinance that you said it was. Yeah, I'm saying it's never, it's really never come up. And, and again, it's pretty clear cut. The only law would be that maybe the civil rights law, and this is adding on to, to protections, not taking away or interfering with any protection. So it's unlikely to preempt, but I mean, we can provide you with more information if that would be helpful on that analysis. Yeah. Well, I still want to thank you for your, uh, for your comments, for your testimony. And, and you know, the uh, accolades given to me are sort of misdirected. I, I certainly am supporting the work of a number of community-based organizations, many of whom are represented here today, who have been um, advocates for this for a long, long, long time at the national level and the city, at the state level and the city level. So we just appreciate uh, their involvement, their engagement. Let me ask one question, though, about the box. It, 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 sometimes it uh, is ban the box totally or just ban the box in the initial discussion, the initial uh, review. Um, you, have there been experiences on both sides, both ways? Uh, have, has the box been totally eliminated from some applications, or is it just kind of moved to the end and, and the discussion takes place at that point? What's the experience been? I mean, I guess I can answer that. <laughs> I could try to answer that. I mean, there are policies where they, uh, Boston is a good example, where they say you have to actually sit down and decide, do you need a background check for every job? And if, that, if that's what you're asking. And they, and they exclude background checks from all sorts of jobs after that thorough kind of analysis. Most places, it's moving it to the end of the hiring process usually the conditional offer stage, which is very important because then you're, you're able to isolate in every other way this person appeared to be qualified for the job and then the criminal record came in. So that's, that's important to make sure that, and some, some policies distinguish between different stages of the hiring process. The conditional offer stage is the most important stage. Well, this committee will have a lot to, to mull over and we look forward to the input from the experts, those at the table and those experts that that are seated out in the audience uh, to give us a better insight on how to make this kind of a policy workable, uh, practical, and fair uh, for everyone involved. Members, any other questions this time? Thank you. Okay, we've got a few cards. Thank you for Thank your you. testimony. Thank you. We've got a few cards on this uh, topic. And let's call up uh, John Howard, Susan Burton, what numbers? Mary Weaver. Good afternoon. I'm John Howland with the Central City Association. Um, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, stating that you'd like the city to work with the business community about this. Um, we think that's necessary. There are a lot of problems that uh, I can think of and we can discuss at a different time with uh, potential issues here. Um, so a blank going forward with the blanket policy uh, without including the business community uh, creates a number of problems. I'd also like to remind you though that you had promised on the street vending issue to work with the business community and we still haven't met with the city to discuss some potential problems there. Um, and finally, uh, as we go forward, I'd like to point out that um, unlike San Francisco, the city of Los Angeles has an unemployment rate well over 9%. Um, simply banning the box will not resolve that. There are quite simply too many people and too few jobs in this city. So the city needs to work on more than just um, these sorts of issues to actually do, present policies that will bring jobs into the city, jobs of all sorts, jobs that don't require background checks to the very top jobs. So we look forward to working with you and this committee on that in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your, thank you for your comments. 
Mr. Good afternoon. Uh, excuse me. So uh, thank you for sh coming today. Is there any group that speaks for small businesses? Um, I believe that a uh, number of the different business organizations have small businesses as members. Is there one group solely of small businesses? Um, depends on, I, I'm not that I'm aware of. And it also would depend on what you consider a small business. Is that 10? Is it 50? Is it 100? Is it, but um, various, there are numbers of local chambers of commerce uh, that speak for small and mid-sized and large businesses. The Central City Association, we have businesses of a few people up to you know, several thousand. So it really, it varies and it depends on the issues that people jo uh, join on, join in on. And we certainly, let me just reemphasize, we certainly wanted to get the input of businesses of all sizes uh, on this matter. And uh, so there's no, uh, uh, certainly no uh, intentional uh, intent to exclude anybody from the discussion, uh, John, you know. So yeah, yes. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ms. Burton. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for being here today to um, look at this fair, cho fair chance uh, ordinance. I'm a resident of the New Ninth, an executive director of a New Way of Life reentry project. Following my, my experience in the criminal justice system, I found it a place that women would have a, 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 a safe place to come back to after they were released from prison. 1982, my five-year-old son was accidentally killed by a police officer. I drank and I used and I got imprisoned. 1996 was the last time I was released from prison. There were multiple prison tri trips. Every time I left prison looking for a job, looking for housing, there was a box. The box still stays there today. I'd like the residents of a new way of life to stand. All I wanted was an opportunity to come back to my community to heal, to be useful, to be productive. The box does not allow you to do that. Not only the box on employment applications, but the box on housing applications also. You see, today I can buy a house, but I check a box to rent a house. So I would like this council to think about all of these ways in which we are stopped from serving the end of our sentence. It goes on and on and on. I guess that's my buzzer. <laughs> Unless you have something to add. No, I just, I just wish we could vote today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mary Weaver. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mary Weaver. I'm the executive director of Friends Outside in Los Angeles County. I am also the co-chair of the employment work group for the Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership, so-called LARP. Uh, to my knowledge, Friends Outside has the longest running employment program for the reentry population in Los Angeles County. We were also the first organization in the county to co-locate our specialized services inside the one-stop centers, including partnerships with City of Los Angeles funded one-stop centers at Trade Tech and UAW. In addition to standing today in support of my colleagues uh, with regards to the Fair Chance Ordinance, for all the reasons that have been presented, I want to also stress the importance of ensuring that effective services are available in support of the changes we hope to make through policy. Most of our clients are not job ready when they come into our offices. I have been horrified of late to hear some highly placed officials from LA County say that many of their colleagues are beginning to believe that this targeted population is unlikely to be successful in employment. That is simply not true. We recently completed a contract with the US Department of Labor through which we had quite impressive results, if I do say so myself. 
all of our clients had been released from prison or jail within six months and had criminal convictions ranging from low-level felonies to sex offenders to murder. We enrolled 446 clients, of which 61% got, 61 got jobs and 78% are in job retention at three to nine months after their job placement. The secret to this success was job readiness. The cost for these services was $2,700 per person as compared with approximately $50,000 per year to incarcerate one person in the general population at state prison and $30,000 in county jail. I'm going to skip to my end. I'm not quite as good as Susan at, fending, at finishing right on time. Uh, may I take one more paragraph? Um, the federal government made a smart on crime investment through our DOL grant, and that investment has paid off handsomely in increased public safety and tax-paying residents. After the ordinance is passed, I ask that the City of LA make a similar investment on behalf of a safe and prosperous future for all of our citizens by ensuring that the necessary services are available to, to accompany improved legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Jose Osuna, Vivian Lee, Cabria Stokes, Frank Alvarez. Thank you, uh, Chairman Price, and thank you, the rest of the council members, for uh, taking the time to uh, look at this ordinance, this issue, and thank you for championing it, uh, Chairman Price. Um, I'm Director of Homeboy, uh, not Director of Homeboy Industries, <laughs> I wish. I'm Director of Employment Services at Homeboy Industries. My name is Jose Osuna. I'm also a member of the reentry population. I served 13 years of my life in the prisons of California. Um, I paid my debt to society during that time. And I have an extensive work experience. Uh, but unfortunately, because I made those choices, my life has been deeply affected. Um, I continue to serve that sentence that Susan Burton talked about. Um, I just wanted to throw some numbers out real quick um, during my time uh, pertaining to my job over at Homeboy Industry. So we serve over 12,000 people uh, in the community at Homeboy Industries. Uh, this year to date, um, 1,800 of those people have come to my department uh, seeking help and finding employment because they find themselves challenged uh, because they have these felony convictions. Um, we have a program that we've been able to really work with the private sector on, which is our solar panel training program. And I just wanted to highlight how, um, the imp how big the impact is when the private sector does uh, work with this population. So that program, uh, we serve over 100 people a year. The recidivism rate for that program is 3%. The national rate of recidivism in the United States is 70%. And we have a 70% nationally. And we have a 3% recidivism rate in that program. Um, and we have a 75% placement rate. And that's because employers are willing to look past that uh, felony, past that choice that somebody made, and offer somebody an opportunity. Um, Overall, at Homeboy Industries, we have a 30% recidivism rate. Um, so we turn that completely upside down. I think that that speaks directly to how powerful the impact is when somebody's given the opportunity to have a job, how important it is, and how uh, integral it is a part of the reentry process for somebody coming out of incarceration. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to note that Mr. Osuna's statistics are even more impressive because that he's comparing to the national recidivism average. And in fact, California leads the nation in recidivism. We have the worst re recidivism rate in the entire country. So if you compare with national California averages, those statistics are even more impressive. Thank you. Um, Vivian Lee. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Vivian Lee. I'm the regional director for REDF. Um, REDF is a California-based venture philanthropy that invests in the creation of jobs and the opportunity to do advance for people who face barriers due to histories of incarceration, homeless homelessness, and other challenges. Over 18 years, we have helped grow social enterprises that have employed 9,000 people and helped many of these individuals move on into mainstream employment. 
Rediff is working with many employers, foundations, and government in Los Angeles and around the state to employ even more people now and over the coming years. A random assignment gold standard study of one of the enterprises in our portfolio, the Center for Employment Opportunities, which employs people exiting incarceration and then places them in other private sector jobs, demonstrated that every dollar invested by taxpayers in the employment of people who are formerly incarcerated generates $3 of positive return due to reduced recidivism and other positive changes. We know, based on experience, how beneficial it is to level the playing field for people who want to and are able to work but are often cut off from this opportunity prematurely. The doors of opportunity would open wider if employers assessed whether applicants meet minimum job qualifications before assessing their criminal history. Thank you. Thank you. Kabria Stokes. Kabira Stokes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Isidore Electronics Recycling. We're an e-waste recycling company here in Los Angeles. We are a for-profit company, and we hire specifically the formerly incarcerated. And there's a couple points I'd like to make. One is that we hire from folks like Homeboy. We hire from friends outside. These are unbelievable resources that this city has, and there is no way to place all of the people who are job ready. They are doing the hard work of actually getting folks sober and housed and ready to work. And we need the business community to step up and say, we see the work that you're doing, and we recognize it. The employees that come to us who are job ready are some of the most loyal and hardworking employees you could possibly ask for. They understand that there are not a lot of folks that are going to give them this chance. And when they get a chance, for the most part, they take it and they hold on to it. And they are wh why our company grows and continues to be successful. I cannot stress that enough. This is an, this is an overlooked resource that we have in this city. Um, I also I hear the concerns of the gentleman from the Central City Association, but as a member of the Chamber of Commerce, I just want to say the business community needs to think smartly about this. We do, for instance, we don't have we we know the box. People, the, the box is checked when they come to Isidore, but we what we have drawn the line at is we won't hire with people who have a history of fraud or identity theft because that makes sense for us because we deal with people's sensitive data. It doesn't make sense for us to say, well, you sold some weed. We're not going to hire you. This, we need to actually think about this in a, in a smart <coughs> way because this problem is not going away, and this is actually a public safety issue. Where, what do we think folks are going to do if they can't be hired? It's actually That's why the recidivism rate is what it is. So it's time to think smart about this, and I really appreciate the city doing this. And I, as a member of the business community, look forward to working with you. On this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Frank. Good afternoon. My name is Frank Alvarez. I'm the senior community organizer at the Los Angeles Alliance for New Economy, Lane, and also the organizer for the Repire LA Coalition. I'm here today to both professionally and personally support this initiative. Um, professionally, Lane and the Repire LA Coalition is in full support of the Band the Box Ordinance. Over the last four years, we've worked with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers to create a fair hiring practice inside DWP. What we're, it's called the Utility Precraft Training Program, and we're seeing, we have right now about a, a class of 100 UPCTs in there, many with backgrounds, but they had an opportunity to prove they've been rehabilitated, to get the support of a local labor union, and then earn their civil service jobs. 23 of the 100 UPCTs have earned their, their a civil service job with the city now. Um, it hasn't been an easy lift. Personally, um, like Jose, I am a member of the reentry community. I'm a two-time felon. Got my first I got my first felony as a juvenile. I spent three weeks in juvenile hall and a, and, and a year on probation. My second felony as an adult, three weeks in county jail and a year on probation. I state that just to show everyone with felonies haven't served life long-term prison terms. Simple mistakes you get caught up with as a youth, as a juvenile, that have lifelong repercussions to your, um, to your ability to earn employment. Fortunate for me, I grew up in a community where we had access to homeboy in the street. So from the moment when I was ready to make that change, I got access to job training. I still go back to this day to get tax removal services. Um, again, this is definitely a, a, an issue that's not going away, and it's something like everyone has said that the city really needs to take a look, have a holistic look and strategies on how we deal with the issue. Um, again, eliminating, it's not just simply eliminating the box, but it's creating a transparent, fair hiring practice where people like myself and others in this room can prove they've been rehabilitated. I'm fortunate enough to work for Lane, who only looked at my resume and my skill set and my 11-year history of working with other organizations, nonprofit organizations in the city of LA. Um, but again, many don't have that opportunity. 
Uh, many are not con don't have a local organization in their area where they could just walk to. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments. Ricardo Reyes. <laughs> Tanisha Denard. Reverend Manns. Rabbi Alexander. Um, is it in a special order? Or? No, you may begin. Oh, okay, well, my name is Tanisha Denard, and along with what everybody said on the panel, I also agree because um, it kills with people's motivation and like their urgency to go find a job. And with the way that our young people are getting prosecuted, many of my peers and many of my cousins and family members aren't even eligible to get a job right now at the young age of like 18 to 19. So what does that mean for their life? It means a lot. That's pushing them to um, to poverty even closer. That means that's, that's a good likelihood of them being homeless because they don't even have the, like the, the self-esteem to even get up and go get a job because they're gonna feel like, why should I waste my time if I know I might not get a job? Um, a lot of people are even sent home without the, the uh, like necessary resources to even get a job, so like tap cards, ID, social security cards, and stuff like that. We should have been working with the Board of Supervisors to pass a resolution so people get that, but what good is that gonna be if I can't even fill out an application? So um, I, would, I also think that it's necessary for those um, things too. And moving forward with the banner box policy, we'll meet a lot of motivation and success for a lot of people that have had a hold on their life for a long time because they get getting out, like I said, um, expected to be like a better citizen or a better American person, but they can't even get a job. Like even little small businesses aren't even hiring people. Places that don't even, that you don't even need to get a, a, need a high school diploma, but you still got to mark that box. And that's putting a hold on a lot of people's life. So thank y'all for taking the initiative to, to bring this forward. And um, I look forward to working with y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Mance. Good afternoon and thank you again. Um, Chairman Price and all other members. I am the founder of a ministry called the Virtuous Woman Incorporated and I recover and I work with victims of sex trafficking and domestic minors. And as we know, a lot of them are detained, they're arrested, they're placed in jail. And this initiative I am 100% in support of because one, it will allow them once we have brought them back into society through group homes or back with the unification of their families to get them the proper education to prepare them for jobs. So removing the box will give them the excitement. We just spoke to another transitional age youth who feels that sometimes they don't even feel like getting up and I experience that now even with some of my 16 year olds that are in group homes or in placement that have criminal records for laundering with the intent of prostitution or carjacking or whatever they have been arrested for that they may never be able to get a job. So this initiative will allow them to move forward in society, build up their self-esteem, and really allow them to move forward into gaining proper careers and having their own families. So I support it 100% and looking forward to working and passing this initiative. Thank you. Rabbi? Thank you, Chairman Price and the Council for giving space I think for the most sacred and dignity affirming hour I have uh, spent in a long time, and I'm a rabbi. Uh, my name is Aaron Alexander. I represent Ikar, a progressive Jewish community on the west side, representing almost 600 families. Uh, in overwhelming numbers, Jews tend to avoid traditional religious space. Uh, there are two exceptions, the Passover Seder, where we sit down in groups and tell our story from slavery to freedom over and over again, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where for 25 hours we fast, we repent, we ask for atonement, and we imagine our greatest, our best selves. While the rituals are moving, it's the universal message that draws so many Jews to these two experiences. And it's this, each one of us can change course. Our decisions yesterday, our choices a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, they may influence our present, they may influence our future, but they cannot be the sole determiner of our future greatness. We come together to experience this moment because while we know that desire is essential, resilience is crucial, 
without a community that celebrates our God-given dignity, without systems designed to urge our success, the walls might just be too hard to climb, the box too thick. The Talmud teaches that the most important kind of relationship is a business partnership because when I succeed, you succeed. When you succeed, I succeed. Our hearts are wrapped up together. It is my opinion that a fair hiring ordinance, a fair chance ordinance in the city of Los Angeles will celebrate the very best of Jewish values and the heart of our tradition. Thank you. Thank you both for your comments. <clears throat> Okay, we've got Mr. Herman, Jamie Garcia, and Chesleen Poe. Mr. Herman? Thank you. Madam? Hi. My name is Chesleen Poe. I'm a member of All of Us and None. I'm also a former client of A New Way of Life. I waited a long time to be able to even consider going looking for a job without checking the box. I started going to prison in 1998, and between prison and, I mean, between uh, violations and convictions, I was uh, in prison between 1998 to 2005. And I would like to say that I would like to see uh, the private sector jobs being considered. It was an article in the Los Angeles Times, October the 1st of 2014, that stated the private sector added 213 net new jobs last month. The private sector is from, this report is from the automatic data processing, and it was in the Los Angeles Times. It's very important that when I go out looking for a job, if I don't qualify for a government job because of my education and the skills that I have, it's important that I be able to go to a warehouse or a construction site or some job with a capability that will offer me a job with the skills that I have. I'm not saying that it's a must because anything you know, is, is governmental. You understand what I'm trying to say? But I'm only asking for the opportunity to be able to go out with as broad opportunity as possible to try to find a job. Because I have come back into society and I have been clean six years and I am ready to go out to society and try to find me a job where I can make a living. All right, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Garcia. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the City Council. Um, my name is Jaime Garcia. I'm the Regional Vice President for the Hospital Association of Southern California. And so I'd like to thank you for the brief presentation earlier uh, today regarding the ban the box. You know, I'm here to uh, you know, express our, our understanding of what your desire is in terms of eliminating this. But we look forward to working with you and your staff in terms of looking at developing this report. You know, hospitals have a unique are unique providers in the community, and I think the state recognizes that, and I think that your legislative experience in Sacramento gives you that, that uh, extra uh, inside knowledge and foresight in terms of what the role of hospitals are in the community. Um, but also the fact that the state does recognize that in terms of having leg regulations that require hospitals or allow hospitals to conduct as background checks, particularly those individuals who will be having access to patients or drugs or medications in the facilities. And so I think that when you, as you continue to work on this report, I ask you to take that into consideration. Medi-Cal, as you are well aware, also has regulations rego regarding the types of, of uh, individuals that are allowed to be, work in a facility, whether we're talking everyone, everyone from the administrative office to down to frontline employees. And so those are a couple of things I just wanted to bring to your attention as you continue to debate this issue and look forward to being a resource to this committee as you, again, move forward on developing your report. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your comments. Um, that concludes our uh, public, uh, public testimony. I think uh, we've had an um, important ongoing discussion of this uh, fair chance proposal. Uh, as I said, it's still uh, a work in progress. Your ideas, suggestions, thoughts are going to be welcomed. 
uh, as the report is developed, once it's developed, as we deliberate it. Uh, and again, we appreciate your attention, uh, your focus, uh, and your assistance in uh, making sure that we come up with the best policies that serve not only the individuals, but the citizens uh, and the city at large. Uh, members, unless there's some other comment? Other comment? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.